Let us turn in God's word to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and reading from verse 13. Luke 24, the 13th verse. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, around seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, Answered, and answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulchre and when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to see the sepulchre, and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. A journey from one place to another is often uneventful. However, there are journeys recorded in the Bible that have proved life-changing. For example, the one that Jacob made, leaving Beersheba for Padan Aram, recorded in Genesis chapter 28, and that night, that vision of the ladder set down, uh, from heaven on earth, whose top reached to heaven, and the angels there, and God speaking, gracious words of promise and assurance. And next morning, he went on his way a different man. God was his friend, and he had nothing to fear, and all would be well. The Ethiopian eunuch returning from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8. Couldn't make out the words of Isaiah the prophet, but Philip was sent to preach to him the gospel based on that prophecy, preached unto him Jesus. And he believed and was baptized and went on his way rejoicing. And then, of course, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, intending to arrest and punish more Christians. And the Lord met him 
and humbled him, brought him down, trembling and astonished. And he was there, led into Damascus, and he became a Christian himself and started to preach Christ to the Jews at Damascus, not the same man at Damascus than he was on his way to Damascus. And here in Luke chapter 24, you have two disciples, one of them named Cleopas. In verse 18, we're told, the other may have been his wife, and they are on the road from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles. And on this journey too, everything changed. And you can see this because we didn't read as far as that, but when the certain thing happened that did, the return journey was very different from the journey there. At verse 17, uh, we read that they had um, communication one with another in conversation as they walk and are sad. But then, verse 33, they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. We can imagine the first part when they were journeying to Emmaus at leaden steps, heavy-hearted. But then afterwards, a spring in their feet, and they got back to Jerusalem with such alacrity, it must have seemed more like 700 yards than seven miles. It's that change that can take place. What made the difference in their case? Well, it was the same as the difference made with those other instances we noted. It was an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, which changed everything. Newly risen from the dead, his meeting them on this road changed their thinking and their outlook, made all the difference to their lives. And perhaps this illustrates a journey that we could make today. If we have come into church like these people, to start with, perhaps heavy-hearted, sad, dismayed, what would make you go home changed for the better? Remember, this happened on the Lord's Day. In um, verse 13, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus. And of course, the same day is the day of our Lord's resurrection. Uh, verse 1, the first day of the week, very early in the morning, our Lord was risen, and every Lord's Day commemorates the risen Christ, that he is alive, that he is the Son of God, and that all the gospel is true. Well, it happened on the Lord's Day, and this is partly what the Lord's Day is for, that we might meet with him, that he might meet our needs, and that we might give him glory and praise for who he is and what he has done. So let us trace then what happened here and let's see how it can apply to us. Let's look first of all at a malady as ye walk and are sad. And then secondly, his remedy. And he said unto them and all that followed. So let's look first of all at a malady. And you can see as they walk and are sad here, and from other verses in this passage, they're afflicted, they're unhappy. What was the problem? Well, it was to do with mistaken expectations. Verse 21, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. 
You see, it's in the past tense. We trusted. Disillusionment regarding Christ and what he had come to do. Hopes that had been raised and are now dashed. And spiritual disappointment affects us deeply. But the thing here was that it was self-inflicted, as it often is. In verses 18 and following, you see that as they explain to the apparent stranger uh, the, the situation, their expectations of the Messiah were not those of the Old Testament. Uh, again, coming to verse 21, we trusted it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Now, what they meant by redeemed Israel was that the Christ should be like another David who would deliver the Israelites from the Romans and reign in Jerusalem. The nation of Israel raised to greatness again, the joy of the whole earth. It was an unspiritual understanding of what Christ the Messiah had come to do. Isaiah 53, for instance, that was preached to the Ethiopian eunuch by Philip made it clear that he was to be a suffering, suffering Messiah and a saviour who would suffer and die to redeem, but not in an outward nationalistic political way, but to suffer, bleed and die to save our souls from sin and from everlasting punishment and reconcile us to God. But the redemption here was not the redemption promised concerning Christ in the Old Testament. And dear friends, it reminds us that probably all our spiritual troubles stem from a failure to understand the scriptures, or at least a failure to take into account what God's word says. We've forgotten. We've not been in the scriptures like we should have done. And human reason begins to take over and interpret things. And we don't see things as they really are. Now there is an equivalent to this. But we trusted. Christians who are stumbled and sad. Because certain expectations, which were not biblical, were not realized. For instance, some Christians struggle with the problem of sanctification. Desire to be holy in heart and life, but the presence of sin in me, which rises up and I'm tempted and horrible things are in my mind and heart. And it's a kind of expectation of holiness that overlooks the fact of remaining sin. You've only got to go to Romans 7 to be delivered from that delusion that there is such a thing as remaining sin in the holiest of Christians that has to be mortified and by God's grace overcome so that we do live a sanctified life from our hearts. But you see, if we overlook remaining sin, if we think that conversion and the new birth eradicates the old nature and there's nothing left now but the new nature, then we're going to be very disillusioned and troubled. That has been the case for a number of people. And the solution is to come back to the Bible and what it teaches about this matter. Some people seek a sign from the Lord to confirm something about themselves, that they are converted, that it gives them assurance. But until that sign comes, they languish. But you see, no such sign is promised. And true enough, the Lord deals graciously and lovingly and wisely with us, but it's, a, it's the reading of the scriptures are right isn't it the understanding of the nature of christian assurance that helps us here but to go beyond that and to wait upon the lord for something to seal us 
so that we're delivered and are happy, well, that is something that's going to lead to disillusionment because it does rarely come, and it can't be based upon that. Back in 1959, it was the anniversary of the 1859 revival, a mighty work of God. And back in 1959, there was the recovery of reformed things in this land, which, for which we were very thankful indeed. But there was also a recovery of expectation. A hundred years ago now, 1959, maybe the Lord is going to revive his work again. And there was much prayer, conferences, preaching on the matter, and a heightened anticipation. But it didn't come, as we know, and it hasn't come. And it can make Christians crestfallen, disillusioned, unhappy. Why hasn't the Lord done this? Well, the fact of the matter is, of course, the Lord is not tied to our dates, is he? And although it would have been, would have been a convenient uh, date a century afterwards, why should the Lord be subject to our anniversaries? The fact is, uh, revival is a sovereign work, isn't it? And he takes his time and way with it. But we trusted, you see, there's a danger in this kind of thing. There have been Christians, and I know of them, contracted cancer, terminal. But I have received a verse, and the Lord has told me he's going to heal me. And this sickness is not unto death. And so the dear one trusts this verse and makes it clear that they've received this assurance. Uh, the Lord is going to rid me of my disease and I'm going to live and all is going to be well again. And the family, Christian family, they're so thankful to hear this. And of course they pray and they, they look for the miracle, as it were. And then that dear one gets worse and worse. And then is called home to glory. And before that dear one dies, there's a struggle. Why hasn't the Lord done this? Why hasn't he kept his word? And when that dear believer goes to heaven, the family left behind struggle as well. But we trusted. But you see, it's ever so easy, isn't it, to find a verse in the scripture that fits your case and is very attractive and can seem to be the Lord speaking. But you can't base your guidance on a single verse of scripture that gives you, apparently, what you really want. When it might not be true at all, it's the overall teaching of God's word, isn't it, that we take into account, not isolated verses. There have been believers who have had a bad church experience, and it's been terrible how they've been treated, and uh, they've had to leave, and then... There's a cynicism about all Christian churches and especially reformed churches and I'll never go to another one again. I trusted, but it didn't turn out the way it did. And again, it's something that needs correcting and there are other reasons and other factors involved most likely. Sometimes it is teachers of error seem to uh, gain success. In Ezekiel 13 and verse 22, there's a very significant verse where God speaks to the false shepherds and he says, with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. It's remarkable, isn't it? God speaking to these people with lies you've made the heart of the righteous sad whom I have not made sad because of the error the false teaching 
that saddened the hearts of the Lord's people, not from God, but from these enemies of God. And the Lord uh, speaks to them. Well, we trusted, we trusted that this would remain sound. We trusted that all would keep right. And now this teaching has come in, it's taken over, and it's doing all this kind of thing, and it, the hearts of the godly are made sad. We trusted. Or maybe Christian family life. Not what we expected. The conversion of all our children. Model family. And it's different from that. We trusted, but it's not happened. And so many false, false dawns, so many disappointed hopes. But the thing about these good people here is that they were not angry or bitter, just sad. Because you see, gracious hearts are not hardened by disappointments and that's why they can be helped and corrected and delivered like these two good people were but be very careful if I speak to anyone in such a case be very careful Hebrews 12 verse 15 lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you there are so many professing Christians who have been dismayed disillusioned and have grown hard and angry and have backslidden and even departed from the Lord because things have not worked out the way they expected and the way they wanted. Root of bitterness. But are ah, these gracious people here? The worst of it for them was they were talking together, commiserating. They were sad. But that's grace, and that's good, because they can be helped. Now, what was the solution? Well, the remarkable thing is the solution was there all the time, because the word was in their mouth and on their lips. Verse 19, Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in, in deed and word before God, and all the people, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Beside all this, today is the third day. Certain women went to the sepulchre and saw a vision of angels. Others went to the empty tomb. They didn't see the body. What, what, what are they saying? They're saying right things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. They're even mentioning the third day. They're speaking about the empty tomb, that really he is alive. So the very things were there to be their greatest help, but it was not, they were not changing them. And of course that's possible, isn't it? You see, we have a great phrase, don't we? We say, God is sovereign. But the thing is, it's got to be more than a platitude, hasn't it? We can say God is sovereign, but what do we mean by that? Well, if he is sovereign, then, for instance, Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9 have to be true as well, don't they? And therefore, they should be a great comfort to us. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, his works and ways are past finding out. And if he is sovereign, it means he's on the throne. He governs everything by a kind and wise providence for his people. And that he performeth all things for us, the great things and the small things. And however things are, they are according to his will and purpose and plan 
and the best for us. You see, they had been reasoning, you see. In verse 15, they communed together and reasoned. But it was human reason that was governing them, not reasoning from the scriptures. And so God is sovereign, and he takes his own way. Sometimes there are what we call providences that turn, turn against us apparently, beneath a frowning providence but he hides a smiling face sometimes there are cross providences which run counter apparently to what we'd hoped for the scriptures we trusted in the promises we stood on and it's the exact opposite at the moment what's going on but God is sovereign it's not a platitude it means that all is under the gracious control and working of a kind, wise, and heavenly Father. And he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards us, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give us an expected end. And what it looks like now is not necessarily what it'll always look like. How things are now is not necessarily what they'll always be. We haven't seen the end of the story yet. And providences have a happy ending usually. Patience. And so there is that comfort. And the Lord is near as he was near to these two to help and to deliver. So the malady then. Let's look secondly at his remedy. He said unto them in verse 17, and it's the beginning of their being changed because you see what happened in verse 15 was this. He came to them as they communed together and reasoned. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. It was a gracious initiative that he took. They did not know him at this time, like Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Uh, she thought he was the gardener until he spoke her name. And we're talking here about his presence that is with us on life's journey. As we are sad for whatever reason, but he has drawn near. He is with us. And dear friends, there is a difference between the belief in his presence and his manifested presence. And our Lord says in John, 8, John 14 and verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you what he means is that inward manifestation of his presence to us whereby we know he's there and you notice it came to them not in the form of an outward view of Christ because their eyes were holden the presence came to him through the word and that answers a question we might ask ourselves or say to ourselves, well, if, if, if the Lord should actually show himself, if I could see him literally, my, that would change everything for me. But it wasn't the visual view of Christ at this point that changed these people. It was the word that he spoke to them. He manifested his presence through speaking to them. And applying his word to their case. And my dear friends, we do not look for visions and appearances of Christ. But we do listen for his word. And we seek that manifestation of his coming to us through his speaking to us. And putting us right. Straightening out our thinking. Applying the scriptures to us in a way that then helps us. To see things as we should have seen them before. 
And notice when this happened, it came to pass while they communed together and reasoned, and it was their talking of Christ that drew him near to them. And it's not to say that he doesn't come near to us when we're alone. Of course he does. But it's often this way, together in Christian conversation, to put an honour upon that. Remember Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, They that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written for those that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. And surely, dear friends, it's a reminder to us of how excellent a thing it is to talk about the Lord together as Christians and how the Lord hearkens and hears, draws near. And we're most likely to be blessed and helped when we do this. But the comfort in this remedy is also he knew how they were feeling. In verse 15, Jesus himself drew near, went with them. Verse 17, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the Lord knew they were sad. And he knows what sadness is because he has suffered the same. The man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he's newly risen from the dead. His sufferings are over. But he has not forgotten what it is to experience sorrow. Neither will he when he ascends to heaven after 40 days and is our great high priest touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He will still have a fellow feeling. And my dear friend, he has a fellow feeling with you in your sadness for whatever reason. He knows your sadnesses and sorrows. He feels them himself and he has sympathy to show and to give. In every pang that rends the heart, the man of sorrow shares a part. He sympathizes with our grief and to the sufferer sends relief. What a great comfort that is. I have the sympathy of the Son of God. He is there saying to me in effect, I know how you are feeling. I have tasted the same while in this sinful, sad world that I have lived for 33 years. And he never changes. It's always like that. Isn't that a great thing to know? That he understands how we are feeling. Remember Joseph when he was put in prison? Genesis 40, verse 7. There were two sad men in the prison. The uh, but butler and the baker of Pharaoh looking very glum because they had this dream, each of them, and couldn't understand the interpretation. And Joseph's words, wherefore look ye so sadly today? And that lifted them a little, even that. A kind and sympathetic fellow prisoner. And he interpreted their dream. And it changed everything for both of them. One of them for the better. But you see our Lord says in effect. Wherefore look ye so sadly today. Joseph is a type of Christ. And now he's with us like this. Understanding all that we are feeling. And then he spoke to them. And uh, spoke and asked the question about what it was that they were conversing about and had made them so sad. But you see that he patiently teaches them, verse 25, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe 
all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then there begins that uh, Bible study on the Emmaus Road, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And there is the beginning of them being helped. And so it is with us. He manifests himself to us through the written word and through the preaching of his ministers who are in Christ's stead. And the remedy for all our ills and struggles, sadnesses, disillusionments, the remedy for them all is always word-based. And that is not to say simply cerebral, intellectual, <coughs> academic. It's through the word but taught of God. It's the internal minister, the Holy Spirit, that when he applies the word and warms our hearts and enlightens our minds and shows us how things are really, then we are helped. So many Christians with their struggles and difficulties. It's for a lack of uh, biblical pastoral preaching that they have not had or have not listened to properly. It puts me in mind of a, a Christian woman once who uh, apparently visited Dr. Lloyd-Jones in quite some distress. Now this was clearly a, a godly, gracious woman. But she complained that she was just in darkness, wretchedness. The Lord seems so far away from me. I just don't know what to do. I've been to people and asked their help. No one's been able to help me. I've been to one and they've suggested I should examine myself and see if there's some great sin that I'm committing that has um, made the Lord depart from me. I've done that. And honestly, there isn't. But it's not done any good. Been to another. They said I must be terribly backslidden because no real Christian who's walking with the Lord ever walks in darkness and they're happy all the day. I do walk with the Lord, I believe, but I am in darkness. I don't know what to do. And sometimes I get to the point where I even think I can't be a Christian at all. Surely this is not, this is not real religion. And so she was very sad. And she trusted, but was in great difficulties. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones, so the account goes, was led to be very wise. And he said to her, there is such a thing as spiritual desertion. When the Lord, for his own sovereign, kind and wise purposes, withdraws his comforts from the soul of a believer. And so they feel in spiritual darkness. He doesn't himself withdraw. He withdraws the comfort and the light of his countenance. And they feel then cold and dark and wretched. And he cited Isaiah 50 and verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? Notice, fearing the Lord, obeying the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. And so it's possible for a real Christian to suffer this spiritual desertion Walking in darkness, no light. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, has a, a treatise on it. The child of light walking in darkness. But notice, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. And the wise doctor applied this verse and exhorted her and says it's not because 
of some great sin. It's not because you're terribly backslidden. It's not because you're not a Christian. It's the Lord, it's the Lord dealing with you in this way. He does sometimes deal with his children in this very way. But heed the comfort of the verse and stay. Trust in the name of the Lord and stay yourself upon God. It won't be permanent. The Lord is doing this for his own reason. Perhaps to try your faith. Perhaps to discover your the strength of your desires after him and how much you long that he should return or to humble you in some way but it's to do you good it's all part of his sanctification not anything wrong but everything right and that application of the word which presumably no one else had done and she wasn't aware of that verse it was deliverance it was liberation it cured the problem and she was like a different woman. She probably went home like these two, going back to Jerusalem with a spring in a step. And you see, dear friends, it's the word of God applied to us in the blessing of the Spirit, his applicatory ministry. And we see things that we didn't see before, perhaps, or things we did know, but we now see them as they apply to our case and oh, it was such a different thing now. Going on to verse 45 of this chapter. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And it made it all clear and plain to them then. And their verdict in verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us? You see, they were taught the fire burned. The Lord turned their cold unhappiness into heartwarming joy. It was like that for the Gentile Christians in Acts 15 at verse 31. Their status was in question. Were they real Christians? Did they have to submit to circumcision and the law of Moses? When they received the apostles' letter, which clarified their status that Christ alone, whether Jew, Gentile or whatever, is the basis for salvation, we read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And that's how it is. The thinking changed. How wonderful is God's word that clears things up and shows us then what we didn't see before. It, didn't, it doesn't always change the circumstances, but it changes us. That's the thing. In the circumstances, so that we're assured and strengthened and renewed in hope and we're able then to carry on. Romans 12 verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, including worldly wise thinking, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Whatever your case, whatever your state, condition, feelings, struggles, God has a word for you. The Lord is with you if you're a real Christian and he will kindly apply his truth as the balm of your soul and the blessing of your life. And thus, with quickened footsteps, we'll pursue our way, waiting for the dawning of the eternal day. Every one of our maladies has his remedy. May we know it today for the glory of his name. Amen.